we continue seeing what new insights we get into game theory from the behavioral uh, viewpoints. And we're going to do it now in section 8.3, fairness emotions, inequality aversion. And we use the Fair-Schmidt model. If we use that model to analyze game theory, what new insights do come? We're going to do it first for the ultimatum game. And I remind, ultimatum game, a sender is endowed with 100 euro, can send part of it X to a responder. Then the responder can decide, accept or reject. So what will happen? What were the empirical findings? We're going to assume that both players uh, behave according to the Fair-Schmidt model. And then what happens? First point to note is that never more than 50 will be sent. Because imagine you are the sender and already uh, at 50 or above, if you then increase your payment more, that means the wealth that you're left with is less, but also the inequality will increase because the other guy is already having more and it's getting only more and more, so to say. So that's just bad. So therefore, the sender at X50 will stop sending more. Therefore, we know that. And that also means that the sender always ends up with more money than the responder. The sender is ahead, the responder is behind. So we analyze from now on the game only with that in mind. Now we're going to look a bit more what happens to the responder. First of all, the responder can reject, then the own wealth is zero. There's no inequality. So the happiness, the wealth it has value zero there. That ha happens in the case of reject. Therefore, the responder will only accept if accept gives 100 or more. So let us analyze the case of accept. And here, maybe I can refresh your memory on the fair schmidt formula. The happiness in the case of accept is X, that's the wealth of the responder. Then uh, 100 minus X is the wealth of the sender, and that minus X is the difference in the payoffs. That's the inequality. Now, uh, we multiply that by that uh, index of aversion uh, being uh, being behind aversion is subjective index of the responder. The asterisk is my notation of multiplication here. Anyway, this is the happiness, the wealth of the responder in case of acceptance. So when will that happen? Let us do a bit of algebra. And I rewrite a little bit. X happens 1 and 2 BR times. And I move this to the other side. So if and only if this inequality holds, I rewrite it, X should exceed that fraction. That is if and only if acceptance is good. Now let's try a few values to see what happens here. Let us first assume, uh, uh, consider the case X equal 50. Well, X equal 50, then it's fair. You both get 50. That's always accepted because then this is uh, always below 50 for every positive BR. So that we already know. Now we look a bit more. Let's assume a very big uh, aversion to being behind of one. That's unrealistic, but let's assume. So the responder the hates being behind. Then if we take by R equal one, then we get the 100 over three. That's 33 about 33.33, but okay, that's round. So that means then only offers exceeding 33 are accepted. So this responder is very critical. Any offer below 33, it's a little bit unfair, already rejected. But this is a bit, uh, well, it happens in Berkeley, but not so much. I already told you that uh, offers of 10 are uh, never, uh, almost never accepted in Berkeley. So let's see when does that happen. But it turns out 10 is accepted if and only if BR is 1 over 8 or smaller. Let us look at this formula. And if BR is 1 over 8, then this is going to be 10 in total. So then indeed, we have uh, acceptance if and only if x is, uh, is 10 or more. And uh, I already told you that this doesn't happen empirically. So that means BR uh, 1 over 8 is too small. Empirically, the responders are more critical than that. They had the aversion of being screwed, being behind, is stronger than 1 over 8, and more than 10 will have to be sent. So that's uh, things for uh, empirical findings for the responder. Now we continue analyzing the game, but now from the perspective of the sender, and let us see for the sender, for, uh, first of all, if case of rejection and the sender has just welfare zero, you know, uh, same story as we saw before. So let us uh, analyze a bit more. What is the happiness of the sender in case of acceptance? And I write the Fair-Schmidt model. We know X uh, less than 50, so the sender is ahead. We know that, so we use the formula uh, having that in mind. Then the wealth that the sender has is 100 minus X. The inequality is that payoff minus the payoff for the responder. So this difference, 
and we multiply by the uh, index of aversion of being had P is uh, abbreviating a proposal. That was another notation for uh, common in the field. We now say send up. But anyway, this uh, is my notation of the subjective index of being ahead of the sender then <laughs> our proposal. And we get this formula. We can rewrite x happens to a minus one times. And here's the other uh, term. We get uh, that uh, term. Now, if AP is bigger than 0.5, so the sender is very social, so to say, really dis really strongly dislikes being ahead, then we can see that this term is in fact positive. So then this is increasing in X. So then the sender is, uh, well, as long as we are below 50, that we always assume, increasing how much is sent to the responder is increasing the happiness in case of acceptance. But of course, it also increases the probability of getting accepted. We have already seen this maximum of 50 that you can achieve that manner. That gives, uh, as we calculated, then the maximum uh, happiness, but that also gives a sure acceptance. We saw that before X50 is always accepted. So if this sender is very socially oriented, that will surely happen. 50 will be sent, will be accepted, and that's the outcome, 50-50 of the game, a fair outcome. But well, usually it's not that strong, and usually this aversion of being had is uh, smaller than 0.5. Then we have this thing is negative, so the happiness in case of acceptance is decreasing in x. So then you get maximum happiness in case of acceptance by taking x equals zero. Well, you would like to have a lot of happiness, but the problem is that x equals zero, the probability of acceptance is zero. Nobody will accept that. So the more you send, well, below 50, but then below 50, the more you send the less happiness you get in case of acceptance, but the bigger the probability of acceptance. And that's a trade-off to be made, not so easy. So how should the sender think about it? When does he have the optimal combination of uh, quite some happiness, but also quite some good probability of acceptance? That is difficult to analyze. And I don't have much to say on that. that it takes more complex models, more complex empirical findings. I don't want to get into that so that I leave for more advanced uh, studies of this topic. But surely the behavioral approach did already bring quite some insights about things happening here and that indeed we do have this deviation from the classical model. The sender is sending more than zero and the responder is sending back more than zero. Those things are happening and we can explain that for sure. So that was quite nice. So instead of uh, further analyzing that game, let's go to another game, the trust game. It is quite like the ultimatum game, but one difference is after the sender sent it X, that amount is multiplied by three by the experimental maybe or whatever. And only after that, the responder has to decide how much to send back. So that's the difference uh, with it. And I should already say the fish meat model doesn't give many insights here. Here, we do have deviation from the classical model, but those deviations are mostly due to other emotions, such as um, trust. Uh, if you are a good sender and you send a lot to, to the responder, will the responder be appreciate that and send back a lot can you trust on that and reciprocity if the responder receives a lot is he willing to send a lot back to to reciprocate this altruism of the sender if you can call it altruism those kind of emotions play a role and they explain what happens empirically and it's not so much inequality aversion so therefore in fact i don't have very much to say about this model with uh, the behavioral models that i introduced you you know we are broad and not deep so it needs further study and you can do that if you like it i hope you do but a few observations uh, I will mention. The modal sending is 50. So half of the 100 is sent to the responder. Then that's turned into 150. And then usually the, the responder, the modal response is that the responder sends back 50. So then the end result is that the sender has kept 50, sent 50 to the responder, received back, it has 100. The responder received 50, it doesn't turn into 150, 50 back, also 100. So 100, 100, and that's fair. They both have the same, and that sense is fair. And here the sender did not gain, because the sender can also send zero, has 100 for sure. The sender did not gain, but also the responder takes care that the sender did not lose from this uh, good act of sending money. So this is the model outcome empirically. And it happens to be that, <laughs> sorry, from the fairness perspective, this gives a completely fair outcome. So Fishmeet might be uh, support this, but still, I told you already, there are many other things going on. And we will just not analyze this further. We'll leave that to uh, deeper studies and maybe in follow-up studies, not in this course. 
Anyway, so now um, let me turn to a few behavioral applications, uh, how we see in empirical reality things happening uh, based on behavioral principles in game situations. For instance, there are restaurants, they use what they call name your price. That means you go there, you have your meal, and when you're finished, you can decide yourself how much you pay. And uh, it turns out that people, uh, usually the more you like it, the more you pay, and you also want to be, if they treat you well and all these things, usually people pay a fair amount of money. Those restaurants can exist, so it works, but it's not at all a classical, you know, formally speaking, you can eat everything and just leave and nobody can do anything. So that's what maybe homo economics would do. That's what the classical rational models would prescribe, but this is not at all happening. People have all kinds of social altruistic feelings, so behavioral models give better insights because they try to capture those emotions. Another example, in the United States in restaurants, uh, the waiters, you are free how much tip to give to the waiters, but the waiters get almost no wage. They have to live almost from the tips. That's their wage, how many tips they get. They really need it. And it works. People know it, customers in the restaurants. So they do give fair tips to waiters so that waiters can have a good existence. So here's another example where just, you know, the classical model would not describe it, but altruism, emotions, all kind of things going on can explain it. And there are many other examples of such things happening. All kind of emotions play a role beyond selfishness, calculating <laughs> homo economicus, and we surely we need uh, homo sapiens and behavioral insights to understand these things. But I don't want to say more, you know, we are broad, not deep. So instead, we will now continue with behavioral application of risky choice, but that is to be continued in the next recording. <laughs>